salvation for us. The Bible says that he sat at the right hand of God. Jesus, the same Jesus you spoke to this morning. The same Jesus who opened the eyes of blind Bartholomew. The same Jesus whom the Bible says was touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He sits at the right hand of God and he makes intercession for us. What do you say? He is our bigger brother and we can talk to him in the morning. What do you say? We can talk to him in the evening. There's a little song which says a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. All right. It is by faith that we see him in the most holy place. And he's there making intercession for us. Inviting us to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find help in times of need. What do you say? And so we must have faith in Christ. Faith in his life. Faith in his death, faith in the blessed resurrection. And so Paul reminds us through the lent and breadth of his writings that we cannot live our lives without faith. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. For they that come to him must believe that he is and that is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. What do you say? I have never seen God. I have felt his presence. There are some things that you cannot explain. But you must accept it. What do you say? I have seen birds pitch on the electric wire. And they are not dead. Are we together? I have seen that. I have seen beautiful plants such as this one. Why didn't they grow upside down? Uh, why were they not arranged differently? You cannot explain that. My brothers and sisters, we accept it by what? By faith, what do you say? You will never be able to explain God. Job asked the question, canst thou by searching find out God? Thus the deist and the atheist and the agnostic will find everything to explain away why there is no God. But I'm telling you today that there is a God in heaven. What do you say? And if we obfuscate our concept of God, then our vertical reasoning will be out of walk. Because there is a God, my friends, and he reveals himself in various ways. But for now we accept him by faith, having not seen him. You see, faith is the ladder that takes us up to God. Having not seen, we believe. But the time is coming when we're going to climb that ladder, what do you say? And when we climb that ladder, we will be in the presence of God. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that now 13, we see through a glass darkly. When we get into the presence of God, that's the time when faith will cease, what do you say? There will be no more faith in the presence of God, but now we need it. To get into the presence of God, what do you say? And so Paul was saying that the righteousness of Christ is revealed from faith to faith. It is not just believing that Christ exists, but living our lives in conformity to his will. And so having labored all his life for the building up of the body of Christ... Having exhorted the church on various subjects, Paul was now in prison. You would have thought that he would be sorry for himself. You would have thought that maybe he would curse God as some of us would do. 
but he took his pen and he wrote his last will and testament to his son Timothy because somehow we felt the need to strengthen Timothy's faith as well as to strengthen the faith of the young church by means of his own example. And so the book of Timothy came as a warning against the hearsay that was to enter the church after his time and to encourage the young Timothy to hold fast. What do you say? What did he say to Timothy? He said, in the last days, perilous times will come. In the last days, perilous times will come, but you must still hold fast. What do you say? Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. If there is ever a time when this is supremely fulfilled in our country and in our world, it is now, what do you say? Where men have become lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, in spite of the proliferation of these things, Paul says to Timothy, hold on, what do you say? Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. But hold on still. Because he's to come, will still come, and will not tarry. What do you say? So irrespective of what you're going through, many are leaving the church. There are many whose faith are waning. But you must still hold on. What do you say? Now let me say this, my friends. The devil works over time. To discourage, to depress, and to destroy your faith in God. The devil is pressing the battle sore in your home, and at school, and at church, and with your finances. But you must hold on, what do you say? During the course of this week, my helper told me that a friend of mine has died. I said, oh yeah? When I called her son, he confirmed it. He said, mama died of cancer. I said, oh, how, how are you holding up? He said, pastor, I am holding on. Life is going to get difficult. Things are not going to be as straight. And as plain as you want them to be, but you must hold on. What do you say? Many of us are going through similar crisis. Sickness. Financial problems, which seem to be the curse of everybody today. Marital problem. But a husband just gets up one day and walks out on his wife for no apparent reason. But I'm telling you, church of God, hold on. What do you say? Hold on! You know, during the American Revolution, as the British were closing in on the colonial towns of America, I think it was George Washington who said, Men, we either hang together or we hang separately. In other words, if the church is united, we can always pose a great affront to the powers of darkness. But the devil is a strategist. And he goes around, my friends, and he divides the church against each other. This member saying that thing and that member saying another thing. And before you know it, we are going to hang together because we do not. We're going to hang separately, rather, because we do not hang together. What do you say? We had better be careful, my friends. Because the things that are separating us are not very substantial. The only enemy we should have today is Satan. What do you say? Not your brother or your sister in the church. The only problem you should have with is sin. 
not with some foolishness in the church. And the devil strategizes. And he brings about these points, my friends, that are separating members from each other. You would be amazed to know that there are people who are not talking to others in church. In spite of that, you got to hold on. What do you say? I told you the story of these three bulls who were grazing peacefully in the Serengeti. They were having a good time. As long as they were together, the lion could not get at them. And so what he could not gain by force, he gained by subterfuge. So he said to the one on the left, your friend on the right is saying something bad about you. And he began to listen, and before long, he was moving away from his three strong friends. And before you know it, he was alone. And when he was alone, the lion pounced on him and had the better of him. And he did that with the other two. What do you say? This is not the time for the church to be moving apart from each other, my brothers and sisters. The Bible says we ought to press together because when we stand united, we can challenge the affront of the enemy. What do you say? We got to press together. We got to be united with each other or we're going to hang separately. You must hold on, I say. Verse 10, Paul says to Timothy, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. You have known my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my charity, my patience, my persecutions, mine affliction, which came to me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra. What persecutions I endure, but the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer what? Persecution. Oh, that's very strange. Very strange. Young Timothy was fully acquainted with the life of Paul. It was not a life of ease. It was one that was fraught with difficulty. It was one that was fraught with trials, hardship. His fundamental charter was to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. What do you say? He endured humiliation, pain, suffering that he might advance the cause of Christ. And then he added, all that will live godly will suffer persecution. It's very strange, my friend. You would think that when you do good, people would love you. You would think that when you're a preacher, everything would be all right. On the contrary, you will suffer persecution. And those of you who come into the church expecting that everything is going to be a bed of roses, you make a sad mistake. You have become a target of the powers of darkness. Oh, you don't believe me. Abraham had to leave the comforts of his home to dwell in desolate places. Jacob, because of his fidelity to God, was a victim of injustice. Lot nearly lost his life because he dared to give hospitality to angels. These men were so vile and corrupt and spewed in their thinking that they wanted to molest angels. And God had to strike them with blindness. Read the story of Elijah. Read the story of Elisha, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. They tell me that if you're doing good, you will suffer persecution. What do you say? I want to tell you that. There's a pastor right now in Iran who dared to get up in a Muslim country and preach Christ. He is incarcerated in one of the worst prisons in Iran today because he did 
to preach Christ. And now they're asking President Obama to intervene. This man wasn't doing anything wrong. He was simply preaching Christ, what do you say? Preaching Christ. Yet he's incarcerated. The Bible says all that will live godly will suffer persecution, what do you say? But let me tell you this. You see, the world looks at the suffering Christian with disdain. But Christ sees him as a precious gem tried in the fire. Jesus himself made it clear. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have what? I have overcome the world. What do you say? You will suffer persecution. I'm telling you. In the world, you will suffer persecution. I remember canvassing in Mandeville years ago in, in, in college. And I went to this lady, tried to sell her some books. She said, what are you about? I said, well, I have some Christian literature I'd like to introduce to you. <laughs> and man, she had an iron gate. It was a farmhouse. And when she slammed that door in my face, the whole house shook. <laughs> slammed the door in my face. Now, I know what some of you would do. Some of you probably would go up on the bank and you'd take a stone and stone her. Or you would curse her. Or guess what? You would pray God for her. That is not right. I hear people talking about how go and pray God for you. That is obia. Be careful what you pray for. There was a time when Jesus was in a certain place and he was talking to these people and they turned their backs on him. The disciples wanted to call fire from heaven. To destroy them. He said you don't know what kind of spirit is within you. And so I went home and I prayed for that lady. I didn't pray God for her. I prayed for her. What do you say? And the next day I was in the same area. There was a big van behind me. And it stood right beside me. She wind down the window. And she said... What you said your name was again, and I told her. She said, I was the lady who slammed the door in your face yesterday. I want you to know that I am sorry, and I want you to stop at my house a little later. So I went to the house. She said to me, you know, from you left, I've had no rest. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> and she bought all the books I had in my briefcase. Are we together? I'm making the point, my brothers and sisters. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation. Sometimes the tribulation are inexplicable. You cannot understand why your finances are just going down and you can't make ends meet. You cannot understand why your husband just become a virago or your